Look down any exclusive country lane in Britain and you're bound to find a Montessori nursery. The Montessori franchise is a global success story and can name some of the world's elite amongst its alumni. But the privileged associations couldn't be further from the vision of its founder, Italy's first female doctor, Maria Montessori. She was committed to the last day, even in the last years of her life, she still saw the Montessori approach to be a tool to changing society, to helping people to have better lives. She was determined that Montessori was for everyone and not just for people who could afford it. Maria Montessori's earliest work as a doctor was treating abandoned children in a mental asylum in one of the poorest areas of Rome. She was a doctor and a scientist, and she looked at children to see how they developed. They were her laboratory. So she observed their behaviors, and then one day she spotted that the children were playing with bread. It was this manipulation of the bread that made her think, if these children had something to manipulate, they might develop better skills. A keen engineer, Montessori designed sensory materials that embedded children's learning in the physical world. And she established a revolutionary philosophy that children are inherently independent learners. The exact models for the materials she designed over a hundred years ago are still in use today. The initial discovery of learning through doing is really key to how the Montessori approach works. In her day, that was very, very revolutionary. Although her method was rigorously scientific, Montessori would go on to become the leader of a worldwide movement steeped in the language of mysticism and spirituality. In her own private life, she was a deeply unconventional and rebellious figure for her time. She never married, abandoned her son to be raised by relatives, and was forced to flee Italy when she came up against the wrath of Mussolini. Mussolini was just not into free thinking, independence, creativity, harmony, peace. Montessori strongly believed that she had found an infallible system that would revolutionize society, enabling the children of the future to be self-reliant, responsible citizens. While Montessorians throughout the world are evangelical about the effectiveness of the method, some educators believe it to be obscure, mystical, or outdated. She was a scientist, she was a visionary. She knew that the world would change. She would appreciate all that we know now from neuroscience about brain development, from the development of sociocultural understandings. I can't think that she herself wouldn't have been influenced by that. So it's a concern to me that some Montessorians and some streams of Montessori are very keen to preserve the original version and to go back to the original text almost as if it were a sacred scripture. Although integrated into some state schools in America and Europe, Montessori's practical system based on children learning independently and at their own pace would appear to be a difficult method to apply within the pressures of a modern state school system. But in 2005, Gorton Mount Primary in Manchester introduced the Montessori approach to early years and key stage one. Because Montessori herself actually started off in schools with the same socio-economic environment that we're in, it kind of seemed the perfect marriage, really. Now, five years on, they're beginning to see some surprising results. It was very, very noticeable that as her confidence increased in her own skills, her behaviour calmed. And this is what we're, we're trying to do with Montessori. We're empowering children to have skills, and the skills will be transferable right through the learning process, right through their lives, really. I mean, my understanding of child development's grown massively, and I feel like what I'm creating for them in the classroom is more effective. It has been a fantastic opportunity to see if it is still as relevant to children as it was in Montessori's day. So what exactly is the Montessori method? Is it an outdated philosophy based on a cult of personality? 
or a scientific method that could still hold some answers to child development and learning. Four, four tens, yep, and then you've got those there. Maria Montessori's maverick personality was already beginning to show itself by the age of 13. With an extraordinary aptitude for maths and encouraged by her mother, she enrolled as one of the few female students in a mostly boys' technical school with hopes of becoming an engineer. But by the time she was ready to go to university, Montessori had shifted her interest from engineering to medicine and was determined to become a doctor. She was one of the first women in Italy to train as a doctor and her training was incredibly rigorous and you just imagine that in her day when she did dissection she couldn't do it with the men. She had to do it at night and on her own so she was very determined young woman. While she was still a student Montessori gained a position as a medic treating children in a mental asylum in Rome. She first came to work with children in the mental asylum because it was felt appropriate for a woman to work with children. She really started as any doctor would by measuring and weighing the children and prescribing appropriate diet. And then one day she spotted that the children were playing with bread at mealtimes making little play-doh balls and it was this manipulation of the bread that made her think if these children had something to play with, something to manipulate, they might develop better skills. It was only when she started to work with the children that she developed the learning materials which are the kind of foundation of the Montessori legacy today. Montessori was part of the progressive movement in education that was happening at the time, but she was the first to put the theories into practice. She was influenced by the French psychologist Edward Sagan's work on sensory education and designed practical developmental materials for the children in the mental asylum. Within these progressively more complex didactic materials lay a series of tasks that Montessori believed encouraged the children's own control of error. In the cylinders, the child repeatedly tries to find the right diameter object. Montessori believed these kind of physical tasks educated the child's eye to recognize mathematical sequences and concepts. The key aspects of her philosophy are of the fact that children learn by doing. Now that has become common day practice. In her day that was very, very revolutionary and the values of the Montessori approach are in following the child. So she's believing very strongly that children have got the capability of teaching themselves. That's, that's what makes it fundamentally different. Within a short space of time working with the children in the mental asylum, Montessori began to see some results and she became so sure of her methods that she took a risk. She entered some of the children into a local government examination. And those children actually achieved very well in those examinations, which prompted her to think, well, if they can do this, what could be achieved with other children if the learning was developmentally appropriate? Montessori was determined to apply her methods with children in mainstream education and she finally got her wish when she was offered the chance to open a school for local children living in one of the poorer areas of Rome. The first school started on the 6th of January 1907. She made a very famous speech in which she, she kind of declared that she was hoping that these children will be the future of human beings. While her work with other people's children was blossoming, her own son, born out of wedlock, was being raised by relatives. Because she had to make the choice. It was her career or the child, because had she chosen to bring the child up in the bourgeois society of Italy in those days, this Roman Catholic society, this would not have been possible. So she gave him up to be brought up in the country, and she went to visit him often but it was only when he was 15 that she told him she was his mother. 
and then they started to work together and collaborate uh, promoting the Montessori approach. But I think that fundamentally had influenced her view of the child because the mixture of guilt and wishing to change children's life is certainly evident in her writing all the time. Montessori's method attracted global recognition as she traveled the world giving lectures and opening new Montessori schools. But at home, in Italy, she found it more difficult to convince Mussolini. She was doing her practice through two world wars and Mussolini was just not into free thinking, independence, creativity, harmony, peace. I think it pushed a lot of buttons. This idea that she had in her head that children needed to be citizens of the world was something Mussolini was not going to have. He absolutely couldn't stand the idea that children should be anything else but Italian because the whole fascist view is to promote the very strong national view of life. And it was at that point when he said to her that she couldn't teach about the world, she, could, she must only teach about Italy, that the break came really. And she left Italy at that point. Maria Montessori finally settled in Holland where her method would eventually become integrated into the state school system. In 1947, she came to London to lecture and helped open the Gatehouse School in the East End. Its founder, 93-year-old Phyllis Warbank, MBE, is still a regular visitor, but it no longer runs as a Montessori school. It was a mixture of backgrounds from the very beginning. Lots of pub teachers' children and barristers' children. I was teaching already but I was willing to go in the evenings and study. So I went to study under Montessori, and actually, because I appeared to understand and so on, we eventually became friends. Okay, so it makes such a big difference to the classroom because it's possible for everybody to see the pictures that we, yes, we need to lucky. look at. And... Aren't you lucky you <laughs> have a wonderful... What do you call it? Because you can't call it a blackboard. No, we call it an interactive white whiteboard because we can actually the children can interact whiteboard. with it. Does anyone know what interactive means? You can basically do anything. It goes on the internet. Good, good. Yeah. We kept individual daily hourly records of every single child. We got scholarships so easily because children were always above the standard by that time because they worked individually. The various areas of the school, we made subject areas and the children moved around at the, when they wanted to, but at the end of a week they had to complete a certain number of hours or time in each subject, so they could do five minutes and then two hours, or whatever way they liked. And uh, it worked amazingly well. Yes, you've always got people to I feel with. sad, very sad, that there is no individualized teaching here now. They no longer really go at their own pace. The Montessori method has found success in the independent private sector, but has not fitted so easily into the British state school system. Montessori based her thinking about what needed to be offered to children on her observations of children. And over time what's happened is that uh, the neuroscientists are finding that the things that she focused on, which are the essentials of a human being when they're growing and developing, and the times in which those things are optimally helped, now becoming very well known within the world of neuroscience. Children are seen as constructing knowledge by actual experience and of course this goes through Piaget, through Vygotsky, through most of the great educators of the 20th century. What's controversial is that since Vygotsky's work the importance of social and collaborative interactions as well as interactions with the environment has been seen. The perceived difference between the way that Dr Montessori would talk about children and the way we would talk about them now is really a historical one. She'd come from what we'd now call 
a Victorian background. So it's a concern to me that in some ways that set of teachings may be stuck in a pre-modern period in which the knowledge that we have now is really excluded. You know, the phrase solitary scientist is used and I think that very much characterises Montessori in the books and in what I've seen in classrooms. That the equipment is there, that the child shows an interest, selects the equipment, works with it to their own satisfaction, completes it and puts it away and there is no need for social interaction. I think that's controversial. I think that's where actually those two hypothetical teachers, the mainstream and the Montessori one, would disagree. One of the things that Montessori still has to offer to society in the 21st century is that we give freedom with responsibility. The responsibility is always there tailored to the age or abilities of the child. We don't have set periods for for lessons. We have achievements that the children need to do each week and we have usually mixed ages in our classes so there is a lot of peer learning that's going on all the time in the classes. Um, you know you might have a three-year-old and a five and a half or six-year-old in the class, you might have a six-year-old and a nine-year-old in the same class and so all the time they're learning from each other. The Montessorian ideal which would be any early educator's ideal would be that you didn't push children forward, that you let the child's interest drive the learning. And I think the age grouping and the, you know, what we have in the national curriculum, what you should be able to do at the age of five and what you should be able to do in year five um, would certainly not fit with Montessori's ideas. In Holland, the Montessori method is embedded all the way through to secondary level in some parts of the state school system. While in Britain, Montessori is only now beginning to widen its association beyond the private sector. There's a huge level of misunderstanding about Montessori. People think that we are a sect. They also believe that it is education for rich kids. Britain has got such a strong ethos of private education and we had no funding for preschool education until 1998 or 99. I mean, you know, early years are relatively new addition to the educational system. So in Britain, inevitably, Montessori could only develop in the private sector, whereas I think that there is a very strong sense of social justice in Holland. What hasn't happened apart from, say, Holland and, and the States is that it's got embedded into the state system so much. But I think that we're now in a situation where that seems to be happening more and more. Gorton Mount Primary in Manchester has managed to absorb the Montessori approach within the expectations of the national curriculum. Two, nine or 16, which is the next smallest. We test from, from five in preparation basically for the SATs. So we do have to offer them and give them that experience of doing it in that way as well as the Montessori way. So it's a blend. So walking, Rebecca. Remember how I showed you this morning, Rebecca? Look at me. Do you remember how I showed you how we choose our own work from the shelves? Okay. When we first uh, had contact with the Montessori organisation, quite a lot of people came to visit and, and to see if it was going to work, because was, this was such um, a different departure for them. Gorton Mount called in the expertise of Montessorians working in the private sector. They received help from Sarah Rowledge, who divided her time between her small private school in Essex and Gorton Mount, where she began training the teachers. I live in beautiful, privileged, rural, leafy Middle England and you read the papers, you read the news, whatever it happens to be, but when you experience the reality, it's quite hard hitting. <laughs> I think in terms of us working with the Montessori community, that was quite a cultural clash, just because our needs as a school and the needs of our pupil cohort and our parents and carers were so different from that of the rest of the Montessori community. And one person actually did say to me from the Montessori community, aren't your children small? 
And, you know, and I said, well, poverty will do that to you, really. And, and they think I'm having a bit of a laugh, really, you know, but I'm not. I actually do mean that. There is a class element to it, but I think that's the Englishness of it. And that's probably not apparent in other places. Um, it's a class element here because it's been associated with, you know, the leafy suburbs and the middle classes and overall with sort of white affluent families. Um, and through no fault of their own, the Montessori teachers and trainers are from that group and hadn't be previously worked with children like the Gorton children. It's only when you actually look beyond that and look through the eyes of the child do you then get back to why you do what you do and how you're doing it. Sarah began by changing the Gorton Mount classrooms. The walls were stripped of all their displays and the children were encouraged to take ownership of their environment. The theory behind it is that if you have neutral backgrounds and um, unadulterated walls, as it were, that you are not overstimulating a child and you're also enabling the child to focus on the job in hand, as it were, which isn't actually the low-flying art displays and all the bits and pieces on the walls. What it is, is what they're there to do at that point in time. Montessori was very interested on the children's levels of engagement in, in the activities because she believed that concentration was the key to their learning and so the environment needed to be prepared in such a way so as to foster concentration in the children. The idea of the classroom being an ordered, prepared, environment in which things were put in places in order that that might foster confidence in the children in the sense that they will be in charge of their own learning. That was a new idea and that was something that I, I, I found uh, very eye-opening. That was what was difficult. They really had to step aside from themselves and take a few risks. So in a Montessori classroom you do not stand at the front and you are not in charge every minute of the day. You allow children to come in and choose what they're doing and you redirect them if they're not doing the right thing or you introduce them to something new if that's what needs to happen to them. I think most of it was quite alien because we did things in a really different way. I did exposition and then we all did a maths lesson at the same time and differentiated, basically worksheet based on each table and we just used hands-on equipment really with children that struggled with the worksheet based work. But I found there was, a, there was a lot more issues with behaviour at that time, and that's been a really big difference for me. Whereas now, everything, I mean, it's totally different. The children are choosing from a range of activities, and most of what's in there is hands-on. The way the environment's set up, we are able to observe children all the time. So we can take a step back. The children access the, the materials and the activities that are out. It's very easy to do that, because the child comes in every day the, the environment is almost identical to the day before. You might have added new things. But you can see each day what that child will go to. So there's a, there's a boy in my class called Liam who every morning will go to the train set uh, and play with that for between five and five minutes, half an hour, even, even longer some days. And that's his absolute need. And because he has that opportunity, he can take it, which is wonderful for him. Children in a Montessori environment have uninterrupted access to their materials and their work for three hours and that definitely goes against the grain. If they're not engaging with maths or literacy, I have to be aware of that and I have to do something about it. I feel as my job in a state school and take action. But something that's different is if a child is, is ever working on something and engaged, I will never force them to leave that activity because they're busy doing it and they're learning something from it. It might not be something that I, you know, understand or I might not recognise it, but if the child's engaged and focusing and concentrating, they are learning something from that activity. And therefore, we will leave them alone and we'll wait till they've finished and then ask them to come and do whatever it is that, you know, we need them to get done. Mainstream educators' idea of achievement is not of completing a set task, but of completing an activity in as many ways as you possibly can. And I think, yeah, that, that's where there is a real ideological and logical clash between Montessorian and mainstream educators. That the Montessori materials, because they're self-correcting, mean that, of course, if you've put, 
if you've managed to get nine of the cylinders into nine of the holes, the last cylinder will go into the last hole and it's done. Mainstream educators don't want things that are just done. It's an approach which looks for divergent forms of intelligence rather than convergent. And the reason for that, of course, is that we believe that we're bringing up children to live in a society which we can't even imagine. And that whereas 100 years ago, what children needed to do was to learn what adults already knew before them, we now have to prepare children for totally unforeseeable circumstances. So showing them how to do something where we know the answer is not the answer. We try to educate children now so that they can find answers to questions that we haven't even thought of yet. I think it's made my teachers better teachers. I think it's made them think more about children at the centre of things. I would also say that it has allowed children to be more talkative, to raise questions and to be more interested in what they're learning. What um, the Golden Mound experiment has shown us, that the predictability and the order that's in the uh, learning environment is in fact the key. And so it has empowered the children to feel that they are in control and I think that as a gift for their future it hopefully will also give them the belief that they can achieve things uh, for themselves, that it is within their power to some extent to change their lives. I think that Montessori would like to see it back in its roots and I think, yeah, I think she'd like the fact that Children from poor backgrounds are still getting the opportunity to do well in education, really. And that is what it's all about, isn't it?